Dr. Ardavan Asley, welcome to the show. Thanks for doing this. Thank man. you for having me. You were we were we were talking off air, and it was I was like starting to get too intrigued. So I was like, okay, hold on, we have to we have to kick this going. So I, I'm, I want you to just continue the thought that you were on. So you're you're not like typical spine surgeons. Continue that. Continue no, that. Thought. Correct. You know, I take pride in the fact that I'm not like a typical spine surgeon because this is the situation. When I first started my practice, I was the typical spine surgeon. And, um, you know, I was trained, you know, you, you get your training from somewhere. So I got my training from other spine surgeons, of course. And I started practicing with that attitude, with their attitude, the first five years of my practice. Um, you know, just, you know, you discussed before this that, you know, everything that has a positive has a negative as well. So when I started my practice, I started my practice in a very small town. And that, it turned out to be the best thing ever happened to me. Why? Because in a small town, you get to know everybody. You know, uh, my uh, office uh, manager is related to a cousin of a patient, uh, somebody that I've operated. I bump into him in the only store that's in the in the town. You know, <laughs> so what that gives me as a spine surgeon is follow up. So. I would bump into my patients six months after surgery, a year after surgery, uh, five years after surgery. Uh, I remember I would bump into my patients' relatives in the ER, and I would ask them, how is so-and-so doing? Uh, sometimes they would tell me they're doing great. Sometimes they will say, no, <laughs> they're still, you know, have this situation. So what I'm saying is in a small town, you get something that you, I don't know, I don't want to, I don't want to, say that they don't get it, but uh, I definitely get a very good uh, follow-up with my patients. So, And probably to a different degree, too. It's not just like in the office. It's like quality of life. You're watching somebody walk around the store or down the sidewalk. It's like you see part of a window into their life whenever you kind of correct. see your patients outside of the office and you know, some for for good and bad to your credit. You know, kind of what you're saying. It, it, but I do think it lends a, a different view on what we're doing in healthcare. That you know, it's not so so you know focused on just one little aspect. When you start to see people outside in their own environment, you have to zoom out and look at the big picture of like. We're not just working on a spine. We're working on a person who has grandkids they have to pick up, and they have you know, a job they have to go to and do things. And to, to look at it that way just gives you a different perspective on what we're trying to do. Absolutely. And that's very important because the surgeries that we do in spine surgery changes lives. Uh, you know, I mean, I sometimes tell my patients that, you know, if you get that surgery, uh, you will become disabled. You know, the surgery will disable you. So that's something that, you know, it, it's very important to tell the patient they understand so what they're getting into. Um, so uh, what I was uh, saying is that, you know, so being a small town, I got to follow my patients very well. Once you follow your patients as a spine surgeon, you realize the limitations of spine surgery. Uh, you know, like when I was in training and in residency, we would see the patient, we would follow up in, you know, two, three months, and then that was it, you know, have a nice life, and, and I didn't know what happened to him. Uh, but now I could see that, you know, hey, um, it's good, uh, it's not bad, but sometimes it could be not so good at all. Um, so uh, I started bumping into chiropractors in town. And um, they wanted to befriend me. In, initially, I was kind of apprehensive. Um, I didn't know. Then I said, yeah, hey, I'm a very open-minded guy. Uh, you know, let me, let me figure out what's going on here. And when I did that, when I befriended the chiropractors, I realized, oh, my God, what I've been missing for all this time. So I started actually talking to them. And I am here to tell you that actually I've learned so much from chiropractors it's just incredible. Uh, and I think really uh, sometimes surgeons get entrenched into their beliefs and they are just absolutely think that they're doing the right thing. And that has caused the problems that I've explained in my book. And that's how we exactly we've gotten here. 
so that's why I say, you know, I'm a different kind of guy. You know, I'm a different kind of surgeon. I'm, 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 uh, you know, really first beginning of my practice, I realized that if you're a surgeon, if you just dare, you have, you hire PAs, uh, you hire, you know, uh, help so they can evaluate the patient and you end up just spending your time in the OR, like a lot of surgeons do, you become a technician. Uh, you just, it, it, it just, you just do one thing. You, you treat MRI, you don't treat the patient. Uh, yeah, that's definitely something I want to dive deep into. Let's, it can, let's give a kind of an overview of the structure of the spine, if you don't mind, and why I think why the, the, the surgical techniques and the spine needs to almost be off on its own. So can you kind of give a little bit of an overview of, of the, how the spine is structured for the listeners. Um, sure. And then we'll kind of dive into sure. it. Sure. Let's bit. go back actually a step further. Uh, so, to become a spine surgeon, you have two ways of getting and uh, becoming a spine surgeon. One is through orthopedic surgery, and that's the route that I took. So, I finished medical school. Then, I uh, finished a residency in orthopedic surgery. So, it was about five years. Then, I did one year fellowship in spine surgery in Boston and uh, I finished my training and I got my job in Northern California. I've been here since. The other route is to become, after finishing medical school, you become a neurosurgeon. So you get into brain surgery and they have a lot of exposure into spine, spinal pathology. And uh, you either have a choice of getting a fellowship or not. But uh, after you finish, you can decide that you wanna be practicing uh, as a spine surgeon, and you become a spine surgeon. So there are two types of training. So the question is, well, what's the difference? Well, initially, um, there was a significant difference. So neurosurgeons will treat the nerves. They would come in and decompress the nerves and relieve the pressure off the nerves. And then the orthopedic surgeons and came and did the carpentry in terms of putting the screws and rods and that kind of stuff. And... Uh, one major difference between neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons is that uh, treatment of scoliosis. So spine um, is basically a bunch of bones that are stacked up on top of each other, separated by a cushion of cartilage. We call it disc. Uh, this disc has two components, uh, a very mushy gelatinous center, and then the very tough onion ring-like ring that holds it together. So the way I explain it is that it's like a tire, but instead of holding air, they're holding the gelatinous stuff. So if there is a increase in pressure because of a trauma, let's say car accident, or let's say falling off a horse, then these fibers can get disrupted and then the stuff in the middle can seep out and cause pain. Um, so uh, spine uh, has three regions, cervical spine, thoracic spine, and lumbar spine. And it's so amazing that uh, each segment is a completely different world by itself. They, they uh, differ in physiology, they, they, they differ in how they function, and they differ how they heal, and uh, the outcomes are so different. For example, surgeries in the neck actually does great. Uh, uh, you know, uh, patients do great, um, heal fast, uh, doctors are happy, patients are happy, and everything is good. In the lower back, on the other hand, um, surgeries are big, uh, recovery is very long, and results are sometimes uh, not good. Sometimes good, sometimes not good. So when we talk about spine surgery having a bad reputation, uh, like you know, I hear this all the time, don't get the surgery or surgery is the last. If they talk about surgery, don't even just, just walk out the office or so, so my patients tell me that I've heard this. Right. You know, that's the lower back that gets that reputation. Um, Why do, do you think that's, and, and we can dive into the mechanics of it. Is that a pressure thing because of how much um, weight the, the lower back has to bear while it's trying to remain stable? Correct that it's just hard for us to mimic our natural anatomy there? Correct. We don't know. I mean, uh, that's another thing. I, before we go any further, I'm going to remind me this note. I want to give you something that I want everybody to understand first. Spine surgery is a very new field. It's a very young field. You know, uh, we started treating scoliosis right around the turn of the surgery, like 1900, but we 
didn't have really treatment until 1950s. Now, spine surgery, as I define it, which is treating injured disc in a way, didn't become available till invention of MRI. The first MRIs were available in 1985. So if you think about it, well, the first MRIs, they were not good quality. So by the time you had good quality MRI that's spread out all throughout the country, we're talking about mid nineties. If you think about 1995 till now, we're talking about only two decades. You know, there's really doesn't give us much, give us much time to really understand what's going on. So that's an incredible, and, and I, I've, I, I haven't thought about it in that term of like, you know, how fast this field has grown. Correct. It's incredible how fast. I mean, I, I was reading in your book how many people are having back surgery every year now. So for something that's that hasn't been around terribly long, whenever we really look at the whole of medicine, um, to be very, very high up there on the number of procedures that are being done every year. Um, that, that's a, a very impressive, uh, growth span. I also think it goes to show you just how, um, interesting I'll use the word, the system is set up that kind of pushes people towards those surgeries in a lot of ways. Correct. And, uh, and, but, but at the same time, I want people to understand that, Hey, some of these limitations that we have is because we're just starting to understand this. So give us a little bit of break here. You know, we're trying. Right, right. We're really trying our best. Uh, but, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, one of the difficulties is that nobody really sat down from the beginning and say, this is the roadmap that we have to follow. This is the first thing that we have to deal with. Then the second thing and the third thing, we never did that. We kind of a, uh, saw a problem and we started treating it without understanding, without getting together and have some sort of a collective goal in terms of this is where we have to do. And that's one of the problems that I think has happened with the spine surgery where we are. Um, so, so let's let's dive into that because you, you kind of create this little little kind of vision, at least from what I see, of where we, you know, we're starting to see these problems that that pop up in you know throughout the spine. There's some specific areas that we see them, and I, I'd love to dive into to why that is. But what are the things that we see, let's say, in the the cervical spine and the lumbar spine, the lower back, and in the neck, that lead to surgery that that put those people in a position that they're going to need sur need surgery right. um and then what do we how do we identify if that's the exact area that needs the surgery correct that you know there was a lot in that question uh but there was uh, two uh important factors in the questions that you asked one is uh what drives somebody for surgery and it's always pain uh, so the world of spine surgery is really divided in two. One is deformity, we call the scoliosis. And in scoliosis, the spine kind of twists on itself, uh, becomes like a kind of a pretzel in a way. Those we call it deformity surgery. Uh, in those surgeries, the surgeries are very long. You have to use long rods. You're talking about fusing whole segments of the spine, try to make it straight. The other world of spine surgery, which is about 90% of the surgeries that are being performed, which I call the true spine surgery, surgery is always performed for pain. And it's always pain. And a uh, patient comes in, uh, they have a neck pain uh, only, they can have a neck pain radiating down the arm, they can have low back pain, or they have low back pain radiating down the legs. So um, about, you know, I would say 90% seven to 99% of the surgeries that I do is to treat pain, basically. Then the question is, well, how do you know what type of surgery to do? Um, this, is, uh, this is one of the things I wanted to mention in my book is that so far, uh, once we had the MRI, we could see bad discs, damaged discs. So we said, okay, well, uh, if the patient has pain, uh, have a bad disc, so probably one of these discs 
is the problem. So let's uh, get rid of them. Let's take them out and fuse them. So the, you take the disc out either from the front or the back, put a spacer and turn the two bones that they were moving against each other and banging that disc. They turn into one bone, eliminating motion and eliminating pain. And that's the surgery that we came up with right around, you know, kind of a turn of this, like around 1990s, um, 1970s to 1990s, let's say. And that's the surgery. Now, the question is, uh, the problem is this. The best test that we have to see the disc, to see the damage is MRI. But here comes the problem. In my world, looks don't matter. Like you, let's say a patient comes in, uh, they have a bad back. You look at the MRI, they have a bad disc, one disc between, let's say, L5 and S1, the lowest disc. Then, you yeah. know, you can talk to the patient. And by talking to the patient, you can understand that this is pain mostly coming from the disc. And if the patient has one disc, then the diagnosis is easy. easy. That L5 S1 disc is the problem. So uh, if you have to do surgery, let's say you do whatever you can not to do the surgery. And yeah. the decision for surgery or no surgery is purely patient's decision. Because I always tell my patients, you cannot, I cannot look at the discs and say where the pain is coming from or how much pain you're suffering from or what's going to happen to you. Some people get better. Some people don't. We don't understand why, you know, uh, has a lot to do with how long you've had the pain. If you've had the pain for one or two months, then there's a very good chance that you'll get better. If you have the pain more than a year, then chance of you getting better is not good, especially if you've tried other things like therapy, physical therapy, injections or so. So the length of the yeah, it's interesting how much that like w when you say how much you're you're doing surgery for pain, and pain is if there's one thing that's hard for us to quantify and identify, it's pain. Like you know, being able to tell a patient where their pain is coming from is one of the most complex things out there that because there's so much emotion tied to it, blood flow tied to it, inflammation, mechanics, movement. And we try to identify, you know, what is the pain generating tissue through an image. And we're making all of our jobs pretty difficult whenever we're talking to patients about where their pain is coming from. Correct. Especially when it comes to the surgery. Uh, I'll give you an example. I had a patient uh, about 10 years ago. It was a nurse at a hospital. Uh, and uh, she came to me. She had a very bad neck pain. And she said, I can't live like this. She tried injections, she tried therapy, and she just didn't get better. So I got the MRI and she had a really bad disc between um, C5 and C6. Um, now, my attitude wasn't exactly like this, but was kind of like this, saying like, oh, don't worry, I'll fix you. You know, yeah, no problem. We'll be, we fix these and, you know. So, uh, of course, she was a nurse at the hospital. She knew me. She trusted me. I went ahead and did the fusion surgery. I went from the front, take the disc out, put a spacer. The surgery healed really well. Her pain didn't go away. I was like, oh, no. Now what? She's a nurse at the hospital. What do I do? You know, and she stuck with me, actually, uh, for a year. I set, me, myself, I sent her to... Other surgeons, as a second opinion, uh, other surgeons saw her at least two and said, Dr. Azzi did the right surgery. The surgery is healed. We're sorry. Uh, this is it. You're stuck with this. So I followed her for about a year. After a year, I talked to her. I said, look, there's another disc below it between six and a seven. And it looks great, except one small, tiny little tear. Very small. I mean, it's not even close to the disc where I did the surgery. But it could be that. And that's the only thing that I see. And I told her, I said, I cannot talk about another surgery. Because God forbid, if you, I do the surgery, you're not better now. You've had two surgeries and still have the pain. I can't live with myself. However, it could be that. And you, you, this is your body. You need to make that decision. So she came to me, she said, I can't live like this. 
I'm going to take my chances. I would like you to do the surgery. So I did the surgery on the disc below that it was much better looking than the disc. And the pain went away completely. I mean, that just tells you what a difficult job as spine surgeons we face in terms of doing a surgery, one surgery, and fix everything. And that's one of the things yeah. that I try to make my patients understand in my book. Um, very early in my practice, I realized that when the problem gets too complex, and it always does when it comes to spine surgery, I have to simplify it because I just, I mean, it came to a point, I remember the first five years of my practice, the patient's job, family, uh, uh, some of my patients, they were showing their pictures of their kids. And I'm like, oh, my God, if my surgery doesn't work, they're going to be out of this house. They're going to lose their house. And, you know, it's, it's just so much pressure on the surgeon to take this responsibility. And I had to, I, I eventually at some point I said, I have to sit back and simplify. Um, so basically to, so I learned quickly how to communicate with my patients and make the, my patients understand. So one of the things I talk about is that I divide my patients into two categories, simple and complex. Simple if they have one or two discs that are bad that I see on the MRI. Complex if they have three or more. Why? Why is that important? That's super important. Because if you have one or two discs that are bad, that means your problem is localized. If you have three or more discs, that means your problem is now is regional. Now, if the patient has one or two discs that are bad, the surgery does great. You fuse one or two discs. The surgery is not big. That surgery itself would cause the patient problem. And normally, these patients go back to work pretty, you know, in, in a good rate. Uh, of course, they can have problems down the road, but, but you know, normally they do well. Now, other group, which they have three or more discs, I'm the first one to tell them that, man, if you come to me and you want surgery, I'm going to try my best to talk you out of surgery. However, if you've come to the point that you can't live like this, I'm not going to deny you a surgery that can potentially help you. And that's what I presented to my patients. Why? Because for some reason, and I don't understand. Now, if you go, what are, the statement that I'm about to tell you, you're not going to hear it from other surgeons. So don't go around and say that. I like I it already. Right. Right. For some reason that I don't get it, when you go from a two-level fusion to a three-level fusion, it's a huge jump in terms of the function after the surgery. Because when you make two levels stiff, there's still enough motion patient gets a function. But once you do three or more, the surgery itself will make you retire. You know, the surgery itself puts you out. Sometimes I tell my patient, yeah. I say, you know, when we do surgery, we don't have spare parts that we go in, we fix. It's not like you have a car, you go in and, you know, uh, fix a car, you know, brand new water pump and you're good to go. Uh, and sometimes my patients tell me, say, you know, hey, if you're there, can you look in the other problem? I said, no, surgery is not like a hood of a car. You open up and start looking around. You have to go exactly where you're planning to do this. So you've got to do all your planning before the surgery. Um, so, yeah, so if you do one or two level fusion, these patients do it. But if you do three or four level fusion, the magnet, if you don't have a problem, let's say you have a perfect back, we do that surgery to you, you end up in pain, that amount of scar tissue, because the surgery, we discuss it amongst ourselves, among surgeons. Surgery is a controlled trauma. You know, surgery right. itself. Uh, well, the question is, well, why do we do surgery? What, what do you mean? You know, what do you, well, here's the explanation. It's very simple. When you have a bad disc, that bad disc pain is a sharp stabbing pain that will take your breath away. It is something that does not respond to pain medicine. And it's just severe, patient cannot tolerate. But when you have surgery and you have scar tissue, you have pain because of that surgery, surgical pain, post-operative surgical pain, that pain is a dull, achy pain that you can take a medicine here, you can take a rest, you can put a kind of hot pack or cold pack, whichever, uh, and you can manage it. And that's why we do the surgery because we, in, in a way, we do replace one pain with another pain, but it's totally worth it and that's why we do it because it's unbearable before and now 
patient can have a life. I mean, they have to live around it, but right. they can have a life. Um, so, and that's a lot of what I'll tell them too, is like, there's, there's the pain part and the function part. When the pain means you can't function in life, we've got to do something about it. Like you're not living the life you're supposed to live because of this breath, uh, you know, taking severe pain. And if you're not functioning, that's, that's not the life that you're, you're meant to be going down. If we can trade that one for something that are you perfect? No, but with the, the, the right treatment and the right, you know, surgery, the right rehab, the right daily activities after the right lifestyle, you can get back to where you're living a life that's functional and you're actually doing some things. What role do you see the, the physical assessment when y'all are trying to, to match up like the MRI versus the patient that's in front of you? What's the, the hands-on, the physical, the movement assessment play in kind of determining what type of surgery or where the surgery is going to be? Well, that is a question that I talk about in my book quite a bit. Um, because this is the situation. The surgery that we do right now, right now in our world, uh, what we perform, what we engage in is what we call, what I call shotgun surgery. So you go in, you have, and, you, and we go by the MRI. So if you have back pain, you have two discs that are about, we do two level fusion. Three discs that are about, we do three level fusion. Four discs that are about, we do four level fusion. Why? Because we don't have a way to figure out which disc is the one that's hurting, you know? And last thing you want to do as a surgeon to do a surgery, that patient is not better. I mean, uh, for some reason, you know, it, it's on us now. Oh, Dr. Azzi is a crappy surgeon. I, did, I had surgery and I'm not better. Uh, so no surgeon wants to take that risk. And let me tell you this. I mean, I, I can't tell for, I can't tell for all of us, but I personally, if I do a surgery, nothing in this world is worse than a patient that I've operated on and they're not better. I mean, that's just horrible. I, I just want to disappear, you know? Um, and unfortunately, if you talk to any spine surgeon, they'll say every time we have an office, you know, we come in, we have a clinic, let's say we have 25 patients we see a day, like 20 patients a day. There's always a one or two names that, that, that you're like, oh my God, what am I going to do with this patient? You know, because, you know, they, they, it didn't work for them or they have some sort of an issue. So it's very common. Well, uh, some of the, some of the surgeons, unfortunately, they deal with that with saying, hey, um, sorry, we're going to send you to a pain manager. Um, the way I manage the patient, you know, is that I have to start all over again, because a lot of time, you know, this could be a very simple issue that they're dealing with, like a painful hardware, uh, maybe a non-union, something simple that if you don't take care of it, if they end up in a, uh, pain management, they're done. They're done for life. Nobody can ever figure yeah. it out and they're done for life. You know, they're, they're in pain management. So, yeah. um, so now shotgun surgery, let's go back shotgun surgery. Well, the problem is that we cannot tell which one is the disc that's really causing the pain. So we go, we fix it all. Problem is, I just can't see all of these discs start hurting at the same time. I just, you know, probably one disc, one of them is the one that's really uh, hurt. The pain right, generator. Right, right. So now yep. there comes the training of that surgeon that how to assess, how to figure out where the pain is coming from. This is when observing the patient, examining the patient comes into play significantly. For example, I always tell, and I, and I mentioned in my book, the way the patient walks, the way the patient sits, the way the patient gets up from the chair, these are all a clue. Of course, where the pain radiates, because you know when a disc gets injured, it causes pain in a nerve that's very close to it. Well, each nerve has a certain distribution in terms of motor and sensory, uh, where the pain radiates to, for example, like uh, L5 nerve root radiates to the hip, for example. Uh, so everything that patient tells me is a clue. And throughout years of practice, and it takes, you know, decades for a surgeon to understand it, to grasp this. Uh, through thousands thousands of patients. So what I'd say, what I say in my book is that 
we haven't made a concerted effort to get away from shotgun surgery. I mean, we all do. You go to young guys, especially like if they've been in practice for about five years. Now, I don't want to, you know, uh, assassinate them, uh, but, but because I was one of them. But, I, but we have to. This is something that we need to talk about this is, because we have to have a goal in the world of spine surgery. So the first 10 years of my practice, I would do shotgun surgery, you know, just four level fusion, three level fusion. The second part of my practice, the second 10 years of my 20 year practice, I wanted to focus on see uh, what, which one could be the disc that's causing the pain. Because the difference between a one level fusion and two level fusion in terms of function after surgery is significant. I'll give you yeah. an example, what I'm talking about. I had a patient about two years ago, uh, 33 years old, very young guy, was in a car accident. He had a very bad disc at C5-6, and he had a smaller disc at the C6-C7. I told him that, and we had the injections, we had the therapy, it didn't get better. He was in a lot of pain. I said, look, the first time that I like, the first age that I like to do surgery on a patient is about 35 to 40. I really don't want to operate on a 33-year-old. Why? Because okay. if we do surgery, that surgery has consequences down the road that we do not understand. For example, if you fuse a level, then you can have what we call junctional problem. So you can have uh, a disc next to it that bad because that motion has been transferred into the disc next to it in a way. So yep. at this point, we do not know that uh, is it the surgery that leads to another surgery or that the next surgery. okay can you hear me okay yep, very good. i got you so yep. we don't know that we're trying to investigate that and um we don't know so what we want to do we want to do the avoid the surgery all in all if we can and in a young person to do the smallest surgery so i told the patient i said look you want surgery i'm telling you no uh you're not going for that you want to do the surgery fine but this is my plan I think by talking to you, examining you, uh, and what I see in the MRI, your pain is coming from 5-6 disc. And my plan is to do a disc replacement at the 5-6 disc. But this is the pro problem. There is a situation that uh, there might be some pain coming from the disc below. And there is a chance that if I do the surgery, uh, you might wake up, you, must, you might still have the pain, that might lead to an additional surgery that we have to go back and do the level below. But I told him, I said, I'm confident enough that the, 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 the five, six is the problem. But if you get into a situation that you're not better, we have to do the second surgery. I'm not going to regret my decision. And I need you to understand that because saving a one level, if I can save you a level of surgery, your future would be so much brighter than what you are, uh, what you were heading. Patient didn't like that. Patient wanted to just get fixed and go back to his life and yep. never think or talk about a second surgery. So he went and saw a second opinion and this patient had a two level fusion from another surgeon that was in practice for about five or six years. And a two level fusion in a 33 year old is a travesty because I can guarantee you by the time this patient is 60 years old, he's going to have his entire cervical spine fused. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, of course, uh, and I told the patient, I said, look, it's a very easy decision for me to say two level. You know, I don't have to yeah. worry about anything. We do a two level fusion. I know you're going to get better. And if you're not better, I know I've done the right thing. Nobody can say that Krasley didn't do the right surgery. But it's a very gutsy decision very gutsy mm -hmm. decision to do let's do one and then if that doesn't work for you we'll do the second one because who wants to take on that responsibility that surgery might not right. work for but i'm telling you that i am willing to take that gutsy decision because that upside is so important for you uh that is worth going that direction. now 
only a, a surgeon that's been in practice for about five or 10 years. It's not going to, because he's worried about his reputation, you know, only a guy who's, yeah. it's so I, 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 I wrote in my book. It's just kind of interesting because when I first started my practice, um, I would see uh, surgeons, older surgeons that they were doing these smaller surgery. And I said, Oh man, these guys are not trained very well. You know, <laughs> you know now, yeah. 20 years later, I find myself exactly in the same spot that I'm trying to do smaller and smaller surgeries. You know, it's, in, we see it and we very often will talk to patients about, you know, the, the function and the biomechanic preservation after a surgery. And, when we find a surgeon who actually thinks about that and they're, they're concerned about how you're going to function five years from now, not that you're out of pain in six or six to, to nine months, but what is your life like in your mobility, like in five years? Um, that's, that's the one that we're, we want to talk to. That's who we're telling patients, look, get a, get an opinion from these people. They're actually thinking that layer deeper than just, am I fixing what the, the image shows? It kind of kind of the way we kicked off the conversation. They're thinking about the function of that person. Um, two things came to mind that I, I wanted to ask you about. So, do you know? I, it's been a while since I looked at the research. What percentage of people are walking around with damaged discs that don't have have pain right now? Do you, you remember that off offhand? Absolutely. That's a very common question that I get asked. You know, um, there there's a research that's been done specifically to answer that specific question. Um, I think at the age of 60, almost 50 to 60% of the people yeah. do have this that's, that's worn, you know, um, but, the, but so what, I mean, we go, the pain defines if there's a problem, if you don't have any pain, as yeah. we age, these discs go through wear and tear and they, you know, they herniate and stuff like that. But if they're not causing any pain, there's no problem. But if you have pain that we have to treat it, we have to do all these things and possible potential surgery, then you got a problem. So the pain, existence of pain, defines if you have a problem or not, basically. The other thing that I, we always talk about and we touch on with patients is the, the ability of the body to repair the disc naturally, you know, and, and not just like leaving it alone, but, but with proper treatment and proper lifestyle, um, that there's nothing inherently different about the tissue that makes up the disc that your body can't possibly heal if we do the right things. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, you know, that's kind of interesting because the question that you just asked, we don't know. We just don't understand it. Why? Some people get better within, and it, it has nothing to do with the look, the damage, the extent of the damage. I see patients that they have a horrible looking disc, big herniation, you know, with some therapy within two months, they get better and no have pain. I have patients that they have one little tear and nothing works and they're begging me to do surgery on them. Uh, yeah. So we don't understand what is going on inside the patient. But one of the things that uh, my patients ask me, so, that's the whatever you do let's say i do some injections you know stuff and um as i said i'm a different type of a surgeon i'm not just uh involved in surgeries but i'm actually involved in treatments uh earlier stages of back pain basically so i do some of the pain treatments uh, so um i always tell my patients that you know we got to do this and if it doesn't work then then we have to do surgery uh but why uh, some patients with uh, some minimal treatments, they get better and some people, nothing works. We just don't understand that. Uh, but one of the things that the patients say, well, does the disc heal itself? Uh, then uh, I'm like, yes and no. Uh, the problem with the spine is that you can't fight gravity because as long as you're walking on earth, you know, that disc is getting loaded and there's no way that uh, you know, the tires, like you put a nail, it just goes down. There's no way that the car goes up and sucks air inside and patches the hole, you know, uh, that we don't uh, understand happening very well. Uh, but, um, uh, yeah, I think one of the, the things that's, that's important that we talk with our patients a lot is like, so yeah, most of the time, unless there's trauma present, you know, can somebody I, gets in I an accident. 
I yeah, have to sure. make a quick phone call. Can I take a phone call quickly? Yeah, that's fine. Is that okay? Uh, yep, I'm going to mark us right here. Okay, very good. My wife has an urgent need something. Sure. Hello? Hey, I got you. Ah, okay, great. Oh my God, my wife. <laughs> yeah, every, everything okay? Yes, everything is, she's in at and tried to get a phone for our daughter. That is hilarious. I just got, you You got up and I got a message from mine. I'm at at and I need you to call me about adding a phone. Oh, that's the funny. <laughs> That's that's very strange. Like you walked up, I grabbed my phone because it had been buzzing, and apparently she's trying to do something. To... That's crazy. <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's dive back in. Um, yeah, what I was saying is one thing we tell our patients is, you know, the unless it's trauma, the underlying biomechanical problem that that puts you at risk for, let's say, a disc injury. If we don't do something to resolve that, if that situation is still underlying then it's really tough for us to think that your body could heal it. It's like you having a cut and us continuing to pull, pull the cut apart and thinking like, why isn't this cut healing back up together? So a lot of times we're working with them on like what, what imbalance, what forces, what, you know, biomechanical faults put you at risk to irritate or damage the disc in the first place. If we don't fix those things, then even an amazing surgery injection rehab any of that stuff is just not going to be as successful as it should be correct and that's exactly what i tell my patients uh and it comes down to basically how you treat your back i tell my patients you don't tell your back what to do your back tells you how you can live your life and you better <laughs> listen to it and it all comes down to basically their occupation uh you know if i have a lot of patients that they work in the uh, in a, in a, let's say, uh, carpentry or mecha auto mechanic, or, um, they work at a warehouse or so. And every job title is different. I have some patients work at a warehouse. They have to lift a hundred pound weight. I have patients that work at a warehouse and all they have to do is just walk around and write some notes, you know, but it always comes down to lifting. Lifting is what's going to set you back. And, uh, the problem is that you can lift something right now. You won't feel pain till two, sometimes three days later. And because, and you can go absolutely pain free for a few days. And because people cannot connect the two, they don't know what's going on. And, uh, and, and that's something that, you know, I, sometimes I tell my patients, I say, you don't need surgery. You need a new job. Uh, you need a new career, really. And, and, and yeah. sometimes I even tell my patient, I said, look, 
I, I understand that you've been doing this for all this time, but if you look at the big picture, if you put the effort and this and get a job, even if you get reduced pay, pay uh, you have to change your lifestyle. So you'll be so much better off if you get the surgery because then after that, we don't know where we're walking into. You mentioned something earlier that I wanted to jump into, and that is kind of the science around disc replacements and their effectiveness. I get so many questions from patients about, you know, am I a candidate for, for a disc replacement? What's the difference? What does it do? Let, let's let's dig into that a little bit. Um, you talked about it. Let's start at the cervical spine for, for disc replacements and um, kind of go into, you know, when do you see that work really well? Um, what would patients be dealing with if that was was an option? Because I think the the lower back might be a little more a little more complex on that. Sure, uh, that's something that you know. As much as my book is very controversial, and I uh, talk about all how the industry has driven the spine surgery into a dead end, their dead end, where they get all the benefits and patients don't, and uh, I I didn't want to create extra controversy, but I wanted to kind of brush up on this disc replacement uh, issue kind of a quickly. I just wrote like a couple of just one paragraph. Um, of course, the biggest, uh, let's just go back and explain what we mean by disc replacement. Uh, so far, we've discussed that the, the treatment for a bad injured disc is to take the disc out and turn the two bone into one bone and fuse the two levels. Well. With that, the problem is that now that stress gets transferred to the disc above and below, and now you keep going, you can go on and on and on and on. You know, every two, three years, five years, you get, you know, another fusion till your entire spine is fused. So we wanted to stop that and we said, okay, can we replace it and not fuse it? So um, first disc replacement that was uh, available was for the lower back. When it became available, oh my God, we just all the, surgeons rushed to learn and start doing the surgery. Well, quickly the results came back and they were not that good for the lower back. Uh, so it's a complicated, I don't want to get into it, but right now I would say lower back disc replacement, you can just kiss that goodbye. And I think has two problems with it. One is because of the stress that the bone, uh, bone metal interface, that interface is under a lot of stress in the lower back. Two, the anatomy. Uh, when you go from the front to do the disc replacement, in front of the spine, there are these big veins we call vena cava, big vein, and they're paper thin. They scar down. So if there's a problem, you can't move them out of the way. Uh, people have tried that and they end up killing the patient because it, if it, it's like paper thin. When it gets burst, you, know, you can't fix it. It's really dangerous. So a disc replacement is a one-way street. If it fails, the patient is done. Uh, so let's not talk about disc replacement in the lower back. Now, when it comes to the neck, I like disc replacement. I do quite a bit. I did one about, you know, a couple of days ago, actually. Now, uh, when do we do it? The whole world of spine surgery is divided in terms of who gets disc replacement, who gets fusion. So this is a personal thing. Uh, for me, anybody below age of 40, I would tend to do disc replacement surgery. Anybody above 50, uh, they get a fusion surgery. Uh, anybody between 40 and 50, it's a toss up. So I can talk to them and let them decide what they prefer in a way. Uh, Is that based on activity? Like you do that younger, the, the younger crowd, just because it maintains their, their function in that area longer, they correct. have less risk of needing something more down the road. Correct. I mean, I, I gotta say that, you know, whatever I'm saying, um, it's my personal view and it can change absolutely because we just don't know. These are the, yeah. see, let me, let me tell you this. The problem is that spine, uh, when it comes to spine problem, it's not like blood pressure. We know what blood pressure, normal blood pressure is. We know what abnormal is when it gets abnormal to what level, what medicine to prescribe and what that medicine is going to do. We know all of these. When it comes to spine, how we are billions of people on this planet, nobody's face is the same. That's how the spine is. So, uh, so it's not like, um, oh, uh, this guy needs disc replacement, the other guy needs a fusion. We just, we just don't know. 
Um, yeah, we won't have so, robots doing spine surgery anytime soon. Right, right. And so when it comes <laughs> to disc replacement in younger, I, I would like to do that in a younger age because I don't want to fuse them. Simple as that. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, why do I, uh, in the younger, I mean, in the older patient, why do I fuse them as opposed to disc replacement? Well, because disc replacement and fusion, they both have pros and cons. Um, pro with the fusion is that the results are a little bit better. You know, uh, the pain relief could be complete. Uh, the pain relief could be uh, very good. Uh, and if you fuse that level, that fusion is good for the rest of your life. It's not going to break down. Problem with disc replacement is that sometimes some of the pain, nagging pain, uh, sticks around. Some headaches once in a while. Uh, and it's consistent with the fact that you're not fusing the level, so you still have some area that's moving in that damaged uh, segment. Uh, but the good thing about disc replacement is that the, once you put it in and you heal the wound, patient is done. Uh, you don't end up with a non-union. Uh, problem with the disc replacement is that it's not going to last you the lifetime. Right now, we think that the disc replacement will last anywhere between 15 to 20 years. Uh, at some point, they're going to loosen. We're going to have to go you know, address it somehow. Uh, but we don't know how much that time is. So, um, so if I have to summarize for patients listening to this podcast, lumbar spine, just forget her. If let's say, if I had a problem in the lumbar, I'll never get a disc replacement in the neck. I would definitely consider it. Uh, but they do both, both of them do well. The problem is this back to the controversy. The literature is divided on disc replacement. The majority of the literature, which are paid by the companies that manufacture this, they say disc replacements are awesome. They are better than anything else, and you'll be a fool if you do any other surgery. I mean, that's how their results are. And these are written by doctors who work for these companies. Now, the independent uh, literature says, eh, it's okay. You know, it's, it's still got a lot of problem and a lot of work to do. So yeah. there's a very sharp demarc, and I'm not just saying that. Uh, I actually, that's one of the things I talk about. One of the main things I talk about in my book, I walked into my office in 2020, I think November issue of spine. It's our journal, spine journal, the lead article. This is exactly said word for word conflict, undisclosed conflict of interest is prevalent in spine literature. Undisclosed conflict of interest is prevalent in spine literature. What does that mean? That means our literature is tainted. Yeah. I mean, that's not what I'm saying. This is what our journalists say. <laughs> you know, so, so, I mean, it's come to a point that we don't know who to believe. Uh, right. We don't know what to tell our patients. Uh, we tell our patients still, oh, you're going to be great. You're going to be fine. And then they come back and say, hey, I'm better, but I got this problem, you know, and and it, it's just horrible. It's just terrible what's happening in the world of spine surgery. Yeah, I think in the few disc replacements that we've seen, and, and really, I would we haven't, it's not a ton that, that we see in the neck. Um, they've done, you know for the most part, really, really well if we address a lot of the, the mechanical deficits that they have. Most of these people, we have severe imbalances towards flexion in the spine, which is what we see actually in the lower back these days where everything is so much in front of us that our spine is kind of getting shifted into this like flex position, which puts a lot of pressure throughout the annulus of the disc, the back of the disc. I show my patients our little handy dandy like model. Like if I squeeze the front down at some point, the, the disc is going to want to bulge out on the back right there. And if we leave that in there and we don't ever take that tension back off, then you're even if it's an artificial disc, if it's a disc replacement, you still have that that uh, system that's not functioning normally that your body's going to try and warn you about. It's going to try to get in and tell you, hey, there's a problem here. Correct. Our body does that by sending pain most Correct. of the time. Correct. But but let me tell you one thing, though. I want this to be very clear. This is a, something that I talk about it all the time. And, uh, and I want everybody to understand because it was very important to realize this point because it changed my practice. 
And this is what I say. Be careful who you ask what works and doesn't work. Why? And it, and, it, and it took me five years to understand that. As a spine surgeon, I was trained by my professors that nothing works but surgery. So yeah. that's, what kind of, that's kind of an attitude I started my practice. As I said, in five years into my practice, I started befriending the chiropractors. And I was like, oh, my God, this works. Then it hit me. Um, I remember I had a friend in San Francisco. I was visiting him. And as I was leaving, uh, the, the wife said uh, something about her back. I said, what do you mean? Why didn't you mention it? What's going on? She says, oh, yeah, I have a really bad back. I have a herniation. And uh, I saw a surgeon in San Francisco here, and they recommended surgery. And my friend was a radiologist. And my friend jumped and said, there's no way, no way in this world I'm going to let her have back surgery. I'm like, why? why? Why are you saying that? He goes, because... As a radiologist, all day, all day I see people who have failed back, failed back surgery, failed back surgery, MRI for failed back, this for failed back, that for, I'm like, wait a minute. People who we do surgery, they get better. They're not going to have extra MRIs or x-rays and stuff. That's yeah, they're not, great. So they're you were, <laughs> yeah, Right. You were seeing those patients. So that hit me. What happens is this. If you ask a specialist what they think of other modalities, they're going to say it doesn't work because all they see all day, people who have the other ones. treatments and they didn't get, if they had that mode of treatment, they got better. They're not going to come and see you. So, so important. Right. So I always tell people, I said, and I tell my spine surgeon friends, I say, I have to uh, defend chiropractors with my surgeon friends, and then I have to defend surgeons with my chiropractor friends because chiropractors <laughs> think surgery doesn't work, you know. But but that's because if they end up in, and it's the same thing with us. If they end up in my office after a surgery, unless we were part of the early process, they probably ended up because the surgery didn't didn't do what they wanted it to do. Exactly. So if you ask us without the exact same thing, if you ask us without that that upper level view, you're going to say, oh, no, they don't work. I see the failed ones all the time. Well, of course you do. If they're happy and they feel great, then, you know, right. hopefully, in all honesty, they still do go get some treatment after. Um, and right. I asked some of my staff before I got on, like, what questions would y'all have? And um, one of the docs here was like, why isn't it just that 100 percent of them go and do rehab after? Because we still get it occasionally mm -hmm. from some of the older surgeons that say, like, nah, just just walk at home mm -hmm. and 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 you'll be good you know, right. after something as complex as spine surgery. So he was he was like, ask him if he knows the answer to that. I'm like, right. Well, Right. We can we can dig into that. Um, right. So let's do this. I, I do have. I want to. I want to jump on um, one of your probably uh, soap boxes. Let Let's talk about the way that surgery is performed. Like what's actually being done when we go in and do a lumbar surgery, and what does it look like? What are they doing when they go in there? And um, talk a little bit about using pedicle screws to try and kind of stabilize some of this stuff and what's actually happening with some of that. Correct. And that's the, pretty much the main topic in my book. Uh, this is the situation. So in 1980s, uh, 85 to 1990s, we knew that when we did spine surgery, try to fuse the two bones together, what we would do, we would go in, roughen the bone, throw some bone graft, like bone chips between the two vertebrae, hoping that they will turn into a solid bone, basically. Well, what happens in 25%, so one out of four patients did not heal. To fix that, we came up with what we call instrumentation. We had learned as orthopedic surgeons that the best way of healing bone is to hold the two edges together in a rigid fashion. We call the we call the uh, rigid fixation with plates and screws. So these screws got introduced into the world of spine surgery right around 85 to 90. So when they appear in the world of spine surgery, they were like, "Aha! Uh -huh, we've been waiting for this." So right around. 1995 to 2000, the pedicle screws, they're the large screws that you insert into the bone from the back to the front, became pretty much the standard of care. 
and there are the standard of care right now. If you have a fusion in your lower back or even the neck, there are some screws in the neck that we use. We use everybody that gets a fusion, we get those screws, okay? So this is the problem. Well, I was inventing another device, you know, so right around 2013, I was, I knew that there was a problem with these screws. Why? These screws get inserted into the vertebrae. Well, the block, the, 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 the spine bone, the vertebrae, what we call vertebrae, is not a one solid block of bone. It's an outside shell, it's a very solid bone, we call the cortical bone, but inside bone, it's like a shoebox. The inside bone is a spongy bone, we call it cancellous bone. So when these screws get inserted into the vertebrae, they actually get their grip from cancellous weak bone, not the outside bone. So they're, 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 they use it weak bone. So what happens like when the age goes up right around 65 and above, this cancellous bone gets really weak. So we have a very big population problem with the aging population. These screws will just pull out. We didn't know what to do. So I wanted to invent a device that uh, we address that issue. Uh, and my device actually won the Innovation Showcase in Congress of Neurological Surgeons in 2015. So, uh, so I'm Amazing. legit. You know, my, my uh, invention did win an award. But this what happened. As I was developing that device, I was studying in more and more detail. I had some problems. To solve those problems, I said, well, let me look in the screws, say, how did they solve that? Then I figure out that, oh, my God, they had the same problems in screws as well. Then I said, well, why nobody talking about this? So one thing led to another one led to another one. I found out, oh my God, this is just crazy. What happens is that I looked back at all the papers about these screws. What I found out was frightening. So in 1990, 1990 to 1995, when these screws appeared, the results were not good. Actually, there were about 7,000 lawsuits at some point against the manufacturer, we call it, uh, a company called Medtronic. <clears throat> 7,000 yeah. lawsuits. So the lawyers not only sued the manufacturer, but they sued the surgeons as well. There were about 500 lawsuits against American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and North American Spine Societies. Okay. So that was in 1990 to 1995. Right around 1993, one paper was published by a surgeon named Dr. Zedeblik. He is the chairman of University of Wisconsin Spine Surgery right now. He published a paper by himself. And uh, this paper got published in 1993 and said screws work beautifully. Like they work perfect. They improve fusion rate, they imp improve outcome, and they are beautiful. Once that paper got published in Spine, it gave us green light to use the screws and we just went just crazy with it basically. We started using it for everything. Well, here comes the problem. Between 1999 and 2003, six papers, independent, multinational, multi-center, multi-author papers came out and said, these screws don't work. They do not increase fusion rate and they do not improve outcome. So I said to myself, when I found this out, I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. Well, let me do a little bit more research. Let me find out about that paper in 1993. I thought for, for some time I was living in a movie. I swear to God, if you, if you have a movie that's like about uh, a medical uh, controversy uh, or, or, you know, this one, this one, you can't beat this. This is like so bad. So... Dr. Zedeble, and this is all what I'm saying, it's in Google, it's in uh, New York Post, it's in uh, Wall Street Journal. So he published his paper in 1993. By 1996, as the lawsuits were disappearing, he started getting paid from the company that was manufacturing these screws and actually were being sued. From 1996 till 2004, he got paid $34 million. It's just crazy. Wait, just when you think it doesn't get worse, it got 10 times worse. So he got paid this money. By 2005, they put him in charge of another important study, uh, a study for a product called BMP. It's a bone graft substitute. 
so when we do the fusion, we have to get bone chips. Well, we have to get the bone chips from a donor area. Uh, the problem with spine surgery is that that donor area then, then became a problem. So we wanted to avoid uh, getting bone graft from a patient himself. So there was a hormone that uh, called BMP, a product called BMP that came out and it promised us that it would alleviate need for harvesting bone from the patient. So it's substitute, it's a bone graft substitute. Yeah. Well, uh, and it's a very expensive product. They put him in charge of that study. This time in 2005, he got caught with his results in 2005. As a matter of fact, this is not Wall Street Journal. This is not New York Post. This is an investigation by United States Senate. United States Senate concluded that that paper in 2005 was not, even though it was published under Dr. Zedeblik's name, but was not written by Dr. Zedeblik. It was written by the company. Wow. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? <sighs> just, 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 yeah. just wait, it gets better. So, so, we, so now, bottom line is that we have six papers said this stuff doesn't work. We have one Independent, paper, not, right. nobody backing, nobody getting paid. Right, right. It gets even better. Wait, you see, just when you think it doesn't get better, it gets worse. So the paper that was published in 1993, if you, if you Google, just Google it you know, after the podcast is over, Zedeblik Spine Fusion, you can see his study. This study was published in 1993 as a preliminary report. I spent about two years to find the final report, the final thing. I couldn't. I eventually talked to one of these professors from Midwestern University. He said, oh, yeah, that study was abandoned in the middle, was never finished. Got the results they wanted, shut it down, let them, do, let them put the, the screws in. It is crazy. You know, I mentioned in my book. I went through rigorous training in my residency. I remember award-winning papers getting torn apart. Oh, they didn't do this. They didn't count for that. You know, yeah. right now, right now, if you open the website for North American Spine Society, right now, and you look at the recommendation section, the recommendation sections for use of these screws, you will find Dr. Zedeblik's paper as a reference. If you Google Zedeblik Spine Fusion, you find that paper, you will see that's been referenced in 1,101 articles as of yesterday. 1,001. It is the, that paper in 1993 is the most referenced paper in the entire world of spine surgery. So, so I was like, okay, Dr. Zedeblik did that. What about rest of the spine surgeons? What about leaders of the field? You, I get, I get, I got torn apart for mentioning papers that they were award me. You guys got the paper that was not finished a preliminary report as a final say. I mean, how crazy is that? Uh, it's, yeah, that, it's, that wouldn't that wouldn't work in any other aspect of uh, you know whether like you know put that in the the dietary you know nutrition medicine anything else. There's no way that's flying. It's 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 beyond. So anyway, so biggest thing that patients probably would ask me or readers will ask me will say, well, why didn't you mention it to the leaders of the field? Why didn't you mention the conference that you go to? I have, I have ambushed these so-called leaders. I have chased them down. They have, they have yelled at me. They have said, I, I remember one guy in in uh, 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 Cervical Spine Research Society. I told him, I said, I need just five minutes, five minutes. I want to talk to you about, I, he said, no. I said, just give me five minutes. I want to show you, no, get away from me. That's the response I got, you know, uh, you want to hear Do something? Do you think that's because they really believe that, that what they're doing is right? Or is it that, it, look, this is the way we're doing things. Let's not, let's not rock the boat. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to that very, specific okay. question that you just asked but let me give you a story this is a story that happened to me so it's not like some story that i heard from somebody and somebody took it out of the proportion this is my story i was in uh north american spine society in 2016 so not too long ago uh i got up at that time my knowledge wasn't what it is now so right now I mean, I was just starting to figure things out. I, st I just starting to question things. So I got up and I said, 
you know, hey, we have six papers that saying this stuff doesn't work. Maybe they're trying to tell us something. And then, you know, and they sat down and then they answered some, some you know, the, the, the podium, the people on the podium, they said something that we're aware, but we can deal with it later, something like that. So I didn't want to get into argument. I sat down. 20 minutes later, I'm getting coffee. I'm talking to a, a rep and he introduces me to a surgeon behind me in the line. Uh, I'm not going to mention names. But uh, he told the surgeon, he said, Dr. Asley doesn't like the screw. He goes, oh, you're the gentleman that made that comment about the screws. Well, I just want to tell you that uh, everybody is uh, welcome to their opinion, but you're very wrong. I said, it's not the fact that I'm right or wrong. It's about the research. The research says that this stuff doesn't work. Maybe, just maybe they're trying to tell us something. He goes, I know. I published those papers. Those are my patients. I said, oh, yeah, what's your name? He told me, I know. So, well, let's find out. I had the papers in my hand. He was the second paper. He was the fifth author. He said, see, that's me. That's me. I'm like, okay, well, let's see your, read your paper. I swear to God, this is what the last sentence says. Based on the, pres uh, on the presented evidence, we do not recommend um, routine use of pedicle screws. He looked at it. He struck his chin and said, no, that's wrong. And he walked away. <laughs> that was his paper. So anyways, now back to your question. So for three years, I had this burning question in my head. What is going on? Because there's a sharp difference between neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons. So when I talk about to neurosurgeons, they're like, oh, yeah, you're right. Oh, yeah, sure. We understand. When I talk, say this to orthopedic surgeons, they want to kill me. The second that I mentioned something about that, I questioned the validity of screws. They just want to tear me apart. So I had to, I had to figure this out and I found it. And this is how it goes. As an orthopedic surgeon, it gets hammered into our head for five years that the answer is rigid fixation of uh, fractures. That gets hammered into our head. So as a subspecialty of orthopedic surgery, we learned what we learned in orthopedic surgery, we applied those same principles to spinal treatments. Well, I'm coming out with my book saying that we should have never done that for many questions, which I have explained in detail, but this is how it goes. The concept of rigid fixation works in the extremity, like arms and legs, for one very important reason. Because if you have a construct that's not very strong or you want, to you, know, you want to protect your construct, you have the option of eliminating gravity. You can either put the patient in a sling or you can put them on crutches and non weight there, right? You cannot right. eliminate gravity in the spine. You cannot uh, hold the patient, suspend them in the air for about four months at a time. That, what that means is that the second that patient gets up, that construct, those screws and rods are under stress. So it's no different than making a building a high rise in a in an earthquake zone. We've learned that you don't make the construct stiff. You make it flexible so it can turn and dissipate. It's the same concept. So what I explain in my book is that we need a new set of instrumentation. I call it reactive rigid fixation, not rigid fixation, but reactive rigid. That means that as the spine gets stressed with the instrumentation, the instrumentation can flex and dissipate that energy. And you don't have screws cutting through and everything falling apart and just coming out. Same exact thing. And that's how we should be thinking. So basically I'm come to the conclusion in my book that spine surgery was never meant to be a subspecialty of orthopedic surgery. Spine surgery is a completely different field. There is nothing in orthopedic surgery that you learn that's gonna make you a better spine surgeon. As a matter of fact, if you are transitioning, going from orthopedic surgery to become a spine surgeon, you have to unlearn everything you learned in and relearn what spine surgery is. You know. I was, I looked back at everything. I started questioning everything now. I was like, wait a minute. When you become orthopedic surgeon, you study for five years. And in that five years, your exposure to spine is super minimal, very minimal. And we all, you can ask any orthopedic surgeon or orthopedic spine, they'll tell you that. So yes, 
our exposure is very minimal. Then you do one year, one year of spine surgery, and all of a sudden they 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 let you off into the society to do spine complex spine surgeries. One year, that's it. I mean, it's it's almost like a paramedic training. You know, I mean, it's, <laughs> I, I mean I, no, nothing against paramedic training, but what I'm saying is that, and the spine. This is the situation. Spine is a mechanical device. Any mechanical device has biomechanics that it follows, rules, mechanics, physics that it follows. We never sat down and figure out what those mechanics are because you got to learn that first. Then based on that knowledge, you can start inventing appropriate devices. And we never did that. You yeah, know, that's I, so brilliant. I mean, it really, and, and what you talk about whenever we, you know, look, we're, we're in hurricane zone down here, right? And everyone, that analogy, whenever I read that, that the, the stiffer you make that structure, the more likely it is to fail under stress. And so if we use that analogy in the body where we're twisting and moving and adding forces and jumping, you're like, like, why was that not thought about on the front end of this? Why weren't we doing that early on? Is there a future where that's the answer? Is there a future where we're putting in like a, a, a dynamic or flexible rigid fixation as the the standard of care and how do we get away from this? Well, that's when things become very questionable for me. And I'm very open about this because, you know, uh, this is what I want people to understand. I'm kind of guy that I always say, you don't want to complain about somebody and then become that person. You know, you don't want to criticize somebody and then turn into them, <laughs> you know? So, I want to be very open about this. I told you that I invented a device and my device won the innovation showcase. I was at uh, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. As I said, I don't just write this book. I actually fight the fight. I'm in the trenches. So I was in American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and I got up and I started saying about these, that the fact that all the papers say that uh, they have not been um, proven that the screws work. So, Somebody said, well, all you're doing, you're trying to promote your device. So I said, no, I, and I took that to the heart. I came out of that meeting. I said, you know, uh, he has a point because I don't want to say that, hey, don't use that, use this. Well, there are multiple layers here. So what I did, I, at that time, I stopped developing my device. I said, you know what? It's not about me. You know, because when I started, you know, developing my device, I put a lot of money in it. And my goal was to sell it and get a nice house, get a, you know, vacation home, get a, you know, decent car. Uh, but once I found out what a huge problem we're dealing with, and it's not just for one therapy, one problem. We're talking about an entire specialty of medicine that affects the entire people in this planet. Once the problem got so big, I have to say, I have to sacrifice myself and stop developing that device. So there won't be any issue, any question where my, uh, where my, where I'm coming from, you know. So I, I cannot be accused of me uh, trying to promote my own device. But even if you look back, I've, I've thought about this to a lot of people. I've asked this very same question, and everybody told me, well, if you have a thing that works, I'm like, well. All I have to say is that we know their thing don't work. The screw doesn't work. I mean, it's very, let me explain to you. It's very simple. The vertebrae, you know, kind of stands up and down. The spine goes up and down, right? And the right. screws go, let's say, in a, in a uh, perpendicular fashion, right? In a 90 degrees. So they insert into it. Well, what is the motion of the vertebrae? It doesn't go up and down. It doesn't slide back and forth. It rotates, right? Everybody knows that. Right. Spine rotates. It's a rotational. Well, guess what? If it's a rotational motion, then the screw has to stop and rotate. That means screw has to stop toggle, not pull out. Well, screw is not a device to stop toggle. Screw is 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 not an appropriate device. So 
You tell the screw to do something that's not made for. You give it nothing but cancellous bone. And when the papers come out and say it doesn't work, you don't want to believe it. it I mean, it's just, it's just crazy. <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah, I think it's – look, I think it's admirable that you, you pull back – for the greater good of like getting this information out there. And at the same time, I, like my, my brain is like, well, what if you're right? Like, you know, and, and, and you pull back on, on getting that out there. Um, but you were right all along that that's what's needed to change so many lives to well, change so many backs. Right. And, and you know what, to be honest, that's what I'm scared of, to be honest, you know, that, that same thing that you told me, because I've told myself, I said, what if I'm right? Then what if somebody asked me, okay, well, let's follow what you say. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> That's not what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that just puts so much pressure on me now, you know, because now I was like, wait. you know, my thing is that this. We got to be open mind. We cannot just, one thing we got to, first we have to do, we have to change training. We got to go back to residency and we got to have spine surgery as its own residency. You can't just train for one year and then let them off into the, into the society. Just that just can't yeah, happen. It's so different than anything else. It's so different than hip or shoulder or knee or anything that falls under that. I mean, it's, it really is its own specialty. And, and the training is so bad. Let me tell you this. This is, this, I'm not kidding you. I was trained. This was actually taught to me. This is very important thing that all the professors used to put it in my head that do not operate on somebody who's depressed because you're not going to have good results. Well, after I started my practice, I'm like, they're all depressed. You know, yeah, how they all you, been hurting for you know, a year. Right. How are you not going to be depressed when you have a back? <laughs> You know, like, I'm like, why, why don't you just teach some compassion as opposed to say, don't operate on depressed people, you know, teach some compassion, <laughs> teach them to believe the patient. Because one of the things that they teach you for spine surgery training is that you always got to question your patient. You got to see if they're telling the truth. I'm like, oh, wait, wait a minute. If you don't believe your patient, how are you going to treat them? It's just, it's, anyways, it's just, uh, and, and one of the biggest problems I have is that my suggestion is to change the whole thing from beginning. Yeah. I, well, look, I, I, I thank you for kind of fighting the good fight. I mean, I know, you know, so you look at these things and you're like, man, we, we have an uphill battle. Um, but to me, and I've said this many times before, don't, don't take offense to it. Um, and I don't think you will knowing your information, but I, I've, I've said it to many of my patients. I, I think if we look back in a hundred years, the way that we're doing spine fusions, they will think of that as just barbaric surgeries that if, when they look back at what we did for the last 20 years and they're, you know, looking at, at, you know, bodies and, and medical history, they're going to kind of shake their heads at what we've discovered over the next, you know, hundred years and just say, man, what were they thinking? And your analogy on like the, the, the building structure kind of mimics that is that, uh, you know, maybe our heart was in the right place, but what we've been doing hasn't given the results that we would have wanted. But, but wait, why do I take an offense? And let me tell you this, let me tell you this. I teach young surgeons that the attitude that you should have is that there must be a better way. You, qu I question them. Somebody has to question me. That's the only way we can progress. Uh, and, and, and that's one of the added, one of the reasons we've gotten here because the, the surgical training is this rigid military training that you shut up and you do exactly what I'm told and you stand there and you don't never question the professors. And that's how we got here. Yeah. So what you told me is absolutely, I teach people say, you got to have an attitude that you can do it better than me. I mean, that's the only way we can, and that's healthy. Yeah. That's, I did, I, I like it that way because if you don't have that attitude, we're not gonna go anywhere. We're gonna, you know, I mean, and that's some of the things that I tell these surgeons, I say, if you're sold out on the screw, right or wrong, if you say that this is the best thing that can happen, we're not going, we're on a dead end. We're not going anywhere. And that's the worst you can do. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and you're just not looking at the data if you really think that that's the best we can do. We know we can all be better. Um, having these conversations certainly helps, Dr. Asley. Thank you for writing the book. I'm, I'm, sure. I'm, and on the the home stretch of of my first book. And so now, anytime somebody writes a book, I'm like, thank you for doing that. The amount of energy and stress and and uh, mental trauma to get your information on the page is so valuable and so helpful for everyone. So I really appreciate everyone that's, who is you know, taking that, the time to do it. Right. That's not even the half of it. You know, my wife was very scared for me. My wife, my wife was questioning me, says, you know, you have a good practice. You have, you have a good life. You can just ruin this, you know, and you're going to become a target with very, very famous people. And, but I told her, I said, I can't go to sleep at nights. I, I I can't live with myself if I don't. I, I have to. I I have to let people understand what we're doing to them. It, yeah. It's it's just just crazy. It's so helpful. Um, Doc, we ask all of our guests if you could tell patients or people one thing that they could do today to get a little bit healthier. Um, let's bring this home for them. Give them a little bit of action tips that, that they can do. What would that one thing be? Uh, you got to have a, you got to definitely weight control is very important because the more weight on the spine, the faster it's going to wear out. Uh, eat well, routine exercise to keep your bone quality well. And lifting, lifting is going to, going to get you. So, uh, you know, uh, be very careful. It's, and because there's a delay, you know, it's, it can, it can, uh, you cannot connect the two together. So, uh, yeah, the, 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 the more, what I tell my patients, like, you don't tell your back what to do. Your back tells you how you're going to live your life. If you have that attitude, then you can have a very good life. <laughs> um, doc, we're going to put links to corporate spine. Um, where else can people find you? Where can they follow you? Where can they, they kind of get in touch and, um, catch you online? I have a, a website corporate book, um, corporate spine book.com corporate spine book.com. I have prepared videos. It'll be hopefully about in about a you know week or two, but I have actually every chapter I've come up with a video that I explain just in case people don't understand or they can't read the book. They can actually watch these videos and I explain every chapter. Uh, so I will, uh, I will be reading the comments. Uh, I just don't have time to go back and forth, you know, answering them. Uh, but I can, but I'll definitely read the comments. And if the comments are certain things, then I can have more videos to ask, answer those questions for them. I love it. Doc, thanks so much. I appreciate the time. I appreciate everything you do. Keep, keep fighting the good fight. I love it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Thanks, Doc.